we're not talking about movies. We're talking about scripture and using the movies as a uh, method of understanding what the, the text that we're at. However, uh, the day the movie that we're focusing on today, <laughs> Midnight. Midnight in Orange County. Give us a second. I understand a lot. Is that kind of like uh, you know people look like their dogs, and so uh, <laughs> teachers look like their their students. <laughs> All right, today we're going to talk about the movie Twisters, uh, which has been popular. Uh, PG-13 in the movie. Kate Carter is a brilliant, gifted student training to be a meteorologist. She's been able to read and feel the weather uh, ever since she was a child. We have a great story in the, in the movie about that. She's on the verge of this really huge discovery, and she needs to take a team out to kind of help prove her theory. And uh, her goal is that you know, if you live in a place like Oklahoma, it's the kind of the, the way things are. People's houses get blown up by tornadoes all the time. Cities get torn up. And her goal is to do something that will change that dynamic so that she can make a difference and people don't have to suffer the way they have historically. But when she goes out to prove her theory, tragedy strikes. And so she decides that uh, it's just easier to stay in her lane just do what she does best and, and don't take any risks. Don't uh, try and reach out there because if you do, you might be responsible for even more tragedy happening. Years later, in the wake of uh, an increasing number of tornadoes coming, she is challenged to rediscover her gifts and to help save people again. And so here's the trailer. generation tornado outbreak continues across Oklahoma. We've never seen tornadoes like this before, and we need no, your help. No, I don't chase anymore. Kate, we can save lives. I'll give you one week. All right, fellas. We got PhDs from NASA, FEMA, and Kate. She's the smartest person I know. Hey, dudes. This is interesting. Who are they? It's Tyler Owens. Calls himself a tornado wrangler. If you feel it, Jason! I'm scared of nothing and I'm scared to death. And our crew is not like your crew. I can't breathe and I catch my breath. We don't need PhDs and fancy tech. You know Sometimes the old ways are better than the new. Well, you can always trust a guy who puts his face on a t-shirt. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. You got quite the reputation, city girl. You think you can disrupt a tornado? In theory. But in the field, in the moment, I got it wrong. We never had a chance. You want one? Combining. Go faster. Let's ride. It's all right to be scared. Fear's the reason you do it. You don't face your fears. You ride them. Holy. Have you ever seen anything like this? Not like this. Hold on, hold on, hold on.
<laughs> I'll say amen to that. Everything just crumbles there, but you know where your stuff is. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Well, I need, yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, many of you know what this is. Back in 1995, in the Million Man on, on DC, the Promise Keepers, and there was uh, about a million Christian men who gathered in Washington, DC to pray for our families and our nation. And I just had come back from Europe, living in Europe, and decided to go. I bought a plane ticket and nothing else. I had no idea what I was thinking, <laughs> traveling that far away to the nation's capital to such a big thing and not even thinking, like, where are you going to stay at? That's, that's me right by that tree right there. Like, <laughs> were you there? Yeah. Anybody else there? Oh, nice. I was there. Look you were there? Anybody else? No? So, yeah. So, um, it was a massive crowd. Um <laughs> Where did you stay? Uh, so <laughs> that's so. There's a million men descending on the on the Capitol today. There are 772 hotels in the Washington D.C. metropolitan area with 113,000 rooms. So if you do the math and four guys stay in every room, that still only fits half the men that were present at that time. So the chances of finding a hotel room, getting there, and just showing up and finding a hotel room. Not going to happen. Um, so I had no place to stay again. I was staying alone. I also need to give you some uh, historical context because remember, remember, this is 1995. Google had not been invented yet. So you couldn't Google a hotel room. There was no Uber. There was no Airbnb at the time. There were no smartphones for an Airbnb or all those kind of things. Um, I just needed someone to let me sleep on their floor. And I didn't know, there's a million people there. I didn't know how that was gonna happen. And amazingly enough, I ran into a lot of really, uh, not did I, Not only did I meet some great brothers, but I, friends, brothers from other parts of the country that were gathering for the very same reasons. And uh, eventually, yes, I did find a hotel room to the floor to sleep on. And that's exactly what I did. I slept on the floor that night. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you're uh, maybe just, a victim of your own circumstances, your own stupid choices, or uh, actually you're a victim of something else, a uh, car wreck, a burglary, or purse snatched, uh, lost your wallet, needed someone to help you stop, someone to give you a ride, you know, 10 bucks for gas, uh, somebody to let you use your phone. Now, Martha had a situation on Friday night where some lady just needed to be able to use her phone just as she was in tears because she needed to be able to call her husband. Uh, help paying your mortgage, give you a place to sleep at night, a chance to give you a job, somebody just would take a risk on you, um, someone just to reach out and give you a hand uh, when you need anybody ever, ever, ever been in a situation like that? Yeah. Yes. Been on the side road and needed someone help with their, yeah. you know, it just happens, right? And sometimes it's way worse than others. Sometimes it's a tornado coming through town. Sometimes it's all kinds of things. This past couple of weeks, we've been discussing Hollywood's views on anxiety and we've been discussing uh, in living in the midst of destruction. How do we? What's the hope? What what guidance does Scripture give us in terms of living in the midst of destruction? This movie is you know it's a great summer popcorn movie. All the things that you expect of a summer blockbuster. Right? It's got special effects. It's got romance. It's got this big audacious monster that yes, there are twister sisters uh, that are out there, the twins that come out at the end, but. In the end, this movie isn't about any of that stuff. It very easily could go down that path. Uh, in monster, a movie about monster tornadoes, you could talk about fear and you know all those kinds of things. How it's, however, it's it's not merely about those issues. If you heard in the trailer, one of the guys says, "You don't face your fears, you ride her. And it's not even about that. Uh, that's a part of it, but that's part of the the, the overall message. The core message is. How do you respond when there's people in need? When there's something, because that's the motivation of every character in here is there are people in need and how do they respond to that? In crisis, will you go and help your neighbors? Are you the type that runs into or away from crisis or danger? Will you help them or are you too busy, too afraid, too inconvenienced to be able to go out and help? At several key moments in the movie, different characters are required to make a choice about helping others in danger. Uh, and what's at stake is their careers, uh, their own safety, their finances. Uh, the movie is clear that those who chose choose selfishly are the bad guys. When being challenged, uh, that's what happens when I drink and get popcorn. I thought it was just donuts, but it's popcorn too. 
Yeah. So being uh, being challenged that hey, people are going to die if we don't go and help. One guy goes, I don't care about the people. You know, he just clearly says it right right at the bottom. Another guy who claims the oh, his only goal is to be out there to help people. It turns out he's actually sold out and he's out there actually abusing the people he says is out there to help under the guise of helping him. Another guy who you think is the bad guy is actually proven to be a good guy because he's actually helping people in ways that you don't even suspect uh, throughout the week because you're, you're not aware of things as much. Helping people in crisis, no matter the cost, is the basis of Jesus' most famous parable, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. So turn there. You got your digital Bibles, you can click there. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put uh, Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So this passage says you love your neighbor, you love God by loving your neighbor. That's how God knows you love him is the way that you love your neighbor. So how do you love your neighbor with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind? How do you love your neighbor with all your heart? Ideas? Like you love yourself uh, when you're hungry, you eat. When you're tired, yeah. you sleep. When you need uh, a warmth, you put a blanket on. So you, you're very aware of your own needs. Yeah, pay attention, right? You know, you can tell if your neighbor's having a bad day. You can tell if they're not eating. You can tell if they're not showing up at the front door for a week and maybe somebody needs to go knock on the door, right? So pay attention to them with all your heart. What about with all your soul? Yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> you gotta share the gospel. How you love them with you? Yeah, okay. Pray for them. I think this actually means you become friends with them. I mean, soul to soul, that's a friendship issue. If your soul's not engaged, you can you can love from a distance, kind of. But if you're gonna love them with your soul, that means you've gotta you've gotta get in there. You also open up and become vulnerable. Yeah. And even yeah. allow the person that you perceive that needed to be able to give to you. Mm -hmm. You humble yourself. Yeah, yeah. So that it doesn't feel this Yeah. It feels this Yeah. Any time that you probably have experienced going out and helping someone in need, you realize there was something in you that was helped at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? How do you love them with all your strengths? Going out and helping them, right? Physically, doing, helping them with the tennis or whatever. Yeah. Right? Helping them with their weeds, mowing their lawn. You know, it could be anything. It could be digging a shovel. But your strength could also be your financial strength. Yeah. What about with all your mind? Okay. 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 Back to being a friend, you know, the depth of your friendship. I mean, you can call some of your friends, but not really love them with all your mind. Yeah. It's a cheer. That expertise or the talent that God has given you, right? Because yeah. you spent your time in a career at something, right? And you can give advice. Yeah. Sound good yeah. advice. Yep. Yeah. I, I think uh exactly. Your your mind is a tool that God has given you. And so when you relate to them, it is the skills that you have, and that's the both physically and mentally, but it also is the um you know, the ability to help them think through issues, the ability to be present with them, the ability to engage scripture on a rational basis and help them to, to you know, your brain is your brain. And that's, God asks you to use all of your brain and, and, and engage them with your brain. That isn't the way a lot of evangelism is, is done. There's engaging your brain in that, right? Being thoughtful, being rational, 
Yeah, focus. Uh, having them on your brain. I honestly, this is, as I thought about this, I'm like, man, I don't, I just don't think about my neighbors enough. If you don't think about them, you're not praying for them. So that's a confession. Right. Me was the soul, the soul of the brain surpassing and pushing out whatever part of the race, nationality, past experiences, culture, just the strength of just like getting that out of the way to see the person. Yeah, it's in the moment, whether it's sitting, whatever that is. Like, but loving them because God doesn't see him through any of those that those other things, but like getting past all the skills, which is really so I think part of that too is going back to the loving them with all your soul is to see them through theologically the way God sees them. Yeah. Right? The Imago Dei. They're creating God's image no matter how badly they try to hide it. The drugs, the alcohol, the how smell, the anger, the, all those kind of things. Yeah. Well, that kind of answers what I was going to ask you about the annoying friends. People. <laughs> 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 to try to love them. Well, I, I thought uh, I was amused at Candy's story about the guy who thinks, you know, who's so gruff and, and difficult, and yet the other end, he, he expected that he would have been close enough to be invited to go along. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's something endearing about that, uh, that there's even beyond all of that, that stuff. Right? So uh, he continues, and Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, uh, desiring to justify himself, as we all do, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Uh, that kind of love is uh, costly. I mean, if we're going to love everybody that way, like that's a, that's, a, that's a big cost. So clearly you don't expect me to love everybody that way. Clearly, there's a limit to which you would expect me uh, to do that. It must be a smaller number of people. So he's like, so who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied to him, beautifully, a man was going down from Jericho, uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. So for context, this is actually the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. There's some people in the picture, and I've covered them up with some, some more uh, uh, biblical, historical uh, vis visuals. Uh, it's steep. It's a difficult road to walk on. Uh, there's lots of places along the way for robbers to sneak up on you or to attack you and, and you know beat you up. And that's what happened. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed and left him for dead. So I checked and right now it's 102 degrees in Jericho. If you were beat up and left for dead in 102 degree heat on the side of a road, in 102 degrees, what's going to happen to you? Yeah. <laughs> you're going to bake. I mean, literally, you're going to bake. Uh, there's just not a whole, you're not even going to make it through the day. If you're passed out, you're, you're not going to make it through the day. Uh, so in the midst of that, you need somebody, right, to come. And, and it's, a, it's a journey. It's a 13-mile journey. So it's not quick. So by chance, Jesus says, a priest was going down the road, and he's, when he saw him passed out by the other side, uh, when he saw him, he didn't pass out. He passed by on the, other side. <laughs> on the other side. Think about that. I was uh, thinking of this passage last week when there was a homeless guy on the street uh, in the parking lot where I was coming out of. And, you know, so I just, I, 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 this is exactly the passage that was running through my brain. So I just walked by him. I'm busy. I've got things to do. I've got, you know, I can't help him anyway, kind of thing. And uh, that's what goes through your mind. You know, this priest, he has Levitical things he's running through his brain. I'll get, I'll get uh, spiritually dirty, spiritually impure if I touch this guy. There's, you know, who knows what kind of things. Um, so he doesn't come close. Verse 32 says, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he also passed on the other side. So two guys, both know scripture, both know the law, 
uh, both can come up with reasons for for not going by. Uh, schedule versus love, uh, safety versus love, cleanliness versus love. There's all kinds of things that they could do versus love, right? That's the that's the point is the the versus love things that would happen. Again, what would you hope anybody, even someone, think of the person that just gives you the heebie-jeebies that if that person was the only one walking on that 102 degree road down this crevice and you were beaten up by the side of the road and that person came by you, what would you hope they would do? I'm telling you, no matter how badly you hate them, you would not hope that they would pass by on the other side of the road. You would hope that they would stop. So Kate in the movie has decided, uh, she has to decide what kind of person she's going to be. She had sat in this funk of, I made a mistake. I am no longer going to take any risks. I'm not running into danger anymore. Sat uh, for five years and now she's being challenged that uh, there's an increasing number of storms and we need you back in the field. We need your help because you are the one person you heard in the clip. They said, we've got PhDs from NASA and MIT and all these places, but she's the smartest person in the room because she had more than just uh, educational intelligence and more than just head intelligence. So uh, as she goes, she's being challenged that she needs to take a risk again. You know, if you if you've ever been in a situation where you're responsible for someone and they get hurt, uh, you're less likely. It's it's a it it's a risk to want to be that person again. That you there would be people in your care who could be hers. And yet, uh, there is a greater need for a greater number of people, a greater benefit available if she was willing to do that. You know, help someone stop by the side of the road, there's a car on the side of the road broken down, there's a person on the side of the sidewalk that's passed out, or whatever, you get robbed. You might uh, suffer from the heat as well. You might fall. You might end up down the crevice. You might lose money in the midst of it. Another character in the movie realizes that his whole business plan is going to go out the window if he decides to help people and he has to make a choice. Someone needs to choose to help this guy. Verse 33. But a Samaritan. Again, so some cultural context is helpful here. Samaritans were worse than an enemy because they were that family member who rejected you. Uh, the Samaritans were uh, people who denied that Jerusalem was the capital, denied that uh, David was the king, denied that the books, anything but the books of Moses was inspired by God, denied that the temple was God's place of worship and that that's where they needed to have. Uh, so they were, they were still in the family they believed in the five books of Moses, but they didn't. Believe, they rejected everything else that Jerusalem stood for. And um, in fact, the passage that Jesus is using to teach this is a passage that Samaritans would have accepted in the book of Deuteronomy because it was written by Moses. So this passage would have been a passage that a Samaritan would have understood. And in fact, they would have studied and they would have given the exact same answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. A Samaritan would have given the same answer in this situation. So the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the wounded man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And when he went to him and bound up his wounds, he poured oil, uh, poured on oil and wine. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, olive oil is an antibiotic. And so oil, that's what they would use for their antibiotic as well. Antiseptic, same thing. As is oil. So he pours that out. Uh, as you're hiking, you know, you got your backpack with your 10 essentials, you know, oil and wine were a 10 essentials because not only were they uh, good for health stuff, keeping your skin from getting sunburned, all those kind of stuff, but it was also your food. So it's your, it's your water, water's cut top of the list. They didn't have, they wouldn't carry water, they would carry wine. So this is, he's giving of what he has. Not only that, he's taking a risk, he's stopping Despite the risks, despite whatever agenda, because we're going to see later when he drops him off in the, the hotel, he says, I'll come back. I have things I got to do. I will come back when I'm done and I'll, I'll finish taking. So he has an agenda. You know, the priest, the Levite, they may have had an agenda. We have no idea. But this guy did have something on his plan that he had to do. So uh, despite it, the risks, the agenda, he stops, he touches him. 
So one of the things that's interesting as a chaplain for the fire department that's different between the police and the fire is the police don't touch. They secure the scene, they do all those kind of things, but the firefighters, they got their hands in all the gooey stuff. Their their hands are going right in there. Now they got gloves and stuff like that, but they're they're touching it. it. It's in there. They're close, they're making contact. He made contact with this guy. He has to. He picks him up, he touches him, he helps him. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And the next day he took out uh, took out two days wages, two denarii, if your passage says that, but it's two days wages, and gave him to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. So here's the amazing thing. Whatever you spend, this is a like, you can take my credit card, just go ahead and And I will repay when I come back. First of all, I'll come back, yes, I check that. I will come back, make an commitment to it, he's dedicated to it. And it's like, take whatever you need. Whatever, that's a open ended is, I mean, you, hopefully he knew the innkeeper because the innkeeper could just run up the bill anyway. but. Plus, you don't know who the guy is. He still doesn't know who the guy is. Um, that's pretty amazing. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Verse 37 says, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. So this isn't, this isn't a unique story in scripture. Scripture is full of men and women who did the same thing. Right? Abraham. His nephew Lot gets, you know, taken kidnapped. He fights twelve kings to get his son, his nephew back. Right? Moses, he goes before Pharaoh to demand the freedom of his country. Rahab, you know, she is on the other team. She betrays her own people in order to help God's people. You just get in that situation. Gideon, right, goes out. Super small army, not even close to what it's going to take, but he does it to deliver his people. In fact, all the book of Judges, it's full of such stories of men and women. Deborah who goes out and she raises up an army because sister, the other guy's not going to do it. He's like, no, I'm too afraid. Go if you go. She's like, oh, you know what? I'll do it. I'll take care of it. David goes out against Goliath, the whole army, right? He goes out and steps out in that way. Esther. For such a time as this, that is one of the key phrases, I think, in scripture, because that applies to every one of us. The time and place that you are is the time and place that God has called you for such a time as this, to the people that he's put around you, for whatever the dangers are that are in your situation, we're Americans, folks. Our dangers are not nearly what people around the world face. However, they are profound. We do get tornadoes. We do have robbers. We do have homeless people. We do have all of those things. They are all profound. So you notice that half the people I listed were women in this story? I just think that's an interesting side perspective. But what do they all have in common? In the end, they all could say just what we said earlier. God is great, so I don't have to fear others. So now what? Uh, can you get past your own fears and agenda to go out and uh, help your neighbors? Yeah, but he's a jerk. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the Bible well enough. What if he asks me those questions? I'm afraid of, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't have time. I don't have money. You know, my, my, my knee's bad. You know, whatever. Jesus said in John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. God is a good Samaritan. He opened his wallet to his neighbors who hated him and said, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, and it cost him everything to love us and to restore us to his kingdom. We can run to the rescue because God ran to our rescue first. He set the example and he leaves us behind. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all those men and women who've gone before and have trusted in God's greatness, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Whoever thought you'd see joy in the cross in the same sentence? But it was because of joy that Jesus endured the cross. The joy was you. The joy was he was going to get to welcome you on the other side of the cross. Because of, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding of blood. But you might. You might. Jesus stepped in for us and died on the cross so that we could spend eternity at his father's table. This is his table, reminding us of the father's table that waits for all those who would trust in him. Trust that uh, they need a savior. So as we come, we're reminded of several things. One, we're reminded of the cost. The cost that it cost Jesus to go was to die for his friends. That's exactly what he says. You are my friends. He laid down his life for us so that we don't have to pay the price so that we can be forgiven. Second thing is it reminds us is this is temporary. This is the appetizer. The food in heaven, the banquet table in heaven is what we're called to. That's what he's inviting us to. The third thing it reminds us to is we come together. Every one of us. It's unique and weird. I think that's a big word in politics these days, right? We're all weird in one way or another. And somebody else, we're all weird. Um, in our weirdness, we come together for the same reasons. Jesus died for every one of you. Because he died for you on the cross, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And until he comes again, we, he left us behind to do the work. So we have work to do so that we can go and run back in to the fire and rescue those who need us. Well, thank you. That we're not here based on our works or our goodness or uh, the debt that you owe us. We are here because of your grace and your mercy and your love. And so as we come to celebrate, come with gratitude for you, for your son, but also for the men and women who call us into life. Give us courage to be in the Jesus.